Today's podcast is with Joshua Hanna, and it is probably one of my favorite episodes of all time here on Universe of Game. We've done a lot of episodes, but this one is absolutely incredible because it's about one of my favorite subjects and one of, I think, one of the most interesting and compelling subjects that not a lot of people have realized, and that is the immense amount of research given to us by the greatest researcher of all time, in my opinion, on reincarnation. His name is Dr. Ian Stevenson. Now, Josh knows Dr. Ian Stevenson's work so well because because his great-grandfather also worked at the University of Virginia at a high level. So this is an incredible conversation combining science and spirituality, and I invite you to open up your mind to the possibilities of what could be. It, I think it'd be a good place to start off with kind of your background, because usually it's boring when I ask people about their background, <laughs> but its I don't really think it is, you know, because it sets up yeah. what we're going to talk about. Yeah, for sure. So... Well, um, so yeah, when we first connected, it was on the subject of Dr. Ian Stevenson, who was actually the predecessor of my great grandfather, uh, Dr. David C. Wilson, who founded the department of both neurology and psychiatry that Dr. Ian Stevenson, who was famous for studying reincarnation, he took over that department from my great grandpa. And basically <clears throat> I grew up knowing all the, all the uh, men in the matriarchal lineage of my family were all these like, you know, famous, renowned PhDs and doctors and medical scientists. Uh, David C. Wilson being, you know, pretty much one of the uh, founding fathers of like the Western neuroscience uh, academic methodology. So yeah, I, I think I've always been fascinated by health and, and medicine. And I went to school for holistic medicine, got super deep into studying yoga and meditation um, and, and just passionate about all things health and wellness and peak performance. Mm -hmm. so, so I kind of moved in a different direction where a lot of the, you know, at least my like family heritage is kind of in this uh, very academic, like hardcore reductionist neuroscience mentality. And I had a, I had a really profound spiritual awakening at a young age. And so I moved more into yoga and meditation and the holistic modalities. So we were just talking about how a lot of people know who Ian Stevenson is, that he was the guy at University of Virginia. I think that his work is some of the best evidence we've had of reincarnation. And I've said this like 20 different times because I, I really truly think so, because it's not something you can refute as far as if they have birthmarks on their body that are very similar to, you know, what they cl they claim to remember and that they can find their own bodies from their past life and solve crimes and stuff like, and you probably know this stuff better than I do. But if that's possible, I feel like that's way more evidence than subjective because un unfortunately the problem is, is that you can just, it's not a problem, but the thing is you can just make stuff up. And a lot of people do make stuff up and that's important to recognize. But when you have the work that your grandpa did, you know, it's hard to refute, you know, so he came before Ian Stevenson. Is that correct? Yeah. And I think that's what people really need to understand is that these guys are, these guys were legitimately the OG neuroscientists, right? So at this period of time, uh, neuroscience wasn't a, a like a, a totally integral entity. There was neurology, right, which is the study of the brain and the nervous system, and then there was uh, psychology, and and psychiatry hadn't really had hadn't come into it, its full existence yet. So there was this in 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 medicine, there was a a really deep separation between the mind and the body, and so basically. That psycho the psychological the psychological framework was more of a, a Freudian framework. So if anyone was suffering from depression or certain types of mental illness, it was treated purely from a psychological perspective, and they had a lot of problems with things like schizophrenia. Um, whereas uh, whereas the neurology mainly focused in you know seizure disorders and any kind of classic uh, like sensory motor issues with the brain, and. What happened with my great grandfather is he fought for the convergence of of mind body medicine, and this ended up being in that period of time it was called um, 
uh, neuropsychiatry. So he, he founded both the Department of Neurology um, and Psychiatry, which is what Dr. Ian Stevenson took over, but he really pushed to integrate them together. So there was, there, so there was this new kind of science, which became psychiatry, whether people hate it or love it, but it was a science of understanding how the chemistry of the body really affects, um, affects the experience of the mind. And they started understanding how, you know, schizophrenia and other mental illnesses have a lot to do with actual biochemistry and neurotransmitters, but that was all happening at that time. So when people want to say, you know, oh, Dr. Ian Stevenson was a quack and, you know, anything that's refuting what he was doing, they really need to understand that these guys were like hardcore scientists and at the very beginning of the Western neuroscience movement. Like they have some real stuff behind them. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's what you're saying. Yeah. So when you think about his work, what do you think some of the most profound parts of it are? What are some interesting things that you find? Because some people might be like, I've never even heard of yeah. Well, who is Ian Stevenson? You know, so, I've never heard of any of this. So what are we talking about? <laughs> so so Dr. Ian Stevenson became so famous because he was kind of, a, a as a scientist, he was a bit of a renegade venturing into territory like reincarnation um, and especially being in a chair position in at for neurology and psychiatry at a major university. Um, he was subject to a lot of criticism for going after a subject like reincarnation. But the reason that it happened is because he dealt with so much mental illness and so many people that were trying to heal, you know, psychiatric problems. There was this re reoccurring theme where, where people would bring in their children and these children could like had specific, extremely specific memories of their previous past life identities. And it started happening so consistently that he began to take a really serious interest in it. And that's when things shifted because most people in the industry, especially on the academic side, would just immediately discredit anything like that that came through. Why do you think that is? I think it's because scientists are, are really taught reductionism, right? So it's like, it's like anything that has to do with spirituality, anything that has to do with um, philosophy, isn't in the department of like a materialist reductionist scientist scientific framework, right? So it's like, if you can't measure it, then it probably doesn't exist is, is the, is the academic framework of thought. But Dr. Ian Stevenson was, was fascinated by the subject. <clears throat> that was uh, Descartes, right? That came up with that. And that wasn't like the, right. Uh, that was a, what was that? 17th 18th century it's kind of funny that you say it like that because it's like hundreds of years it's a big difference <laughs> yeah but it, you know that i think there was a it's funny when we talk about these point of views because people think that <clears throat> just because and i was thinking about making a video about this yeah people don't understand that if you go back to, to ancient greece for example even before then aristotle and plato these guys had a belief in a soul of some sort and they yeah. had a belief in a lot of the things that you might call panpsychist now, or you might call uh, idealism, that there's some fundamental building block that we can't understand. And so it wasn't until we had people like Descartes come in and basically be like, well, if you can't reduce it, and that's exactly what you said, mm -hmm. right? If you can't reduce it to something small, then, and you can't measure it, then it doesn't, it isn't there versus the traditional thousands of years old perspective, which is there's something called a force of spirit. You know, not saying Star Wars is thousands of years old, but I'm saying there is a field of energy, right. whatever it's been called. And so that's what I find interesting is that reincarnation is kind of like a, it's part of the Hindu culture that came from the, that Indus Valley, Hindu Valley, Indus Valley. Came, came from that area. Hindu saying that word in itself isn't really accurate because it's a bunch of different stuff and it's kind of colonialism that called them that. But the Vedas, I'm referring to like right. the Upanishads, the ancient texts, like they talked about these things. So it's not a new thing. Uh, that's an, And this is the most ancient religions that we know of on the planet. They say that, yeah. Yeah. They say that India is the mother of all mysticism. Absolutely. And things like that. So as you research his work and you 
Do you ever have any interesting conversations? Like, what did your family say about this stuff? Like, I'm curious because <laughs> well, I want to know. I want to know the <laughs> the indie the, the stuff that most people don't know. Because yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. So before you and I uh, scheduled uh, this podcast, I actually interviewed my 99 year old grandma about this uh, because she has sh- just a wealth of knowledge and she's sharp as a tack, which is amazing at 99. And yeah, I mean, the biggest thing that she stressed is that. Dr. Ian, people that she wanted people to know just in general, based on our family relationship to this, is that Dr. Ian Stevenson was a highly respected academic, you know? So I think what made him brilliant is that he he was well-educated and efficient in reductionist materialist science. But at the same time, he understood that not everything can be measured and quantitized, especially what, you know, what we refer to as metaphysics could just be science that we don't have the tools to measure yet. So what, what Ian Stevenson did is he actually created a system that encouraged skepticism, right? So that's the other thing. He wasn't just like some scientist who was a believer in reincarnation. He actually wasn't at first at all. He was just completely fascinated by the consistency of these children who could remember exact details of their past lives. So what he did is he he wanted to get to the bottom of this. And at first it was kind of just like a, like a hobby expression of his existing work, right? And so he's like, okay, this is happening enough. And now that I have a reputation for this, people are telling me these stories from all over the world. He's getting letters. He's learning about cases that are just absolutely absurd. Children that could remember names of their family members, of where they lived, of how they died. People, people that were killed, like, like that, that was actually the most consistent thing is he said that people who died traumatically and violently had the strongest recall. Because for in his perspective, if this was a real phenomenon, it was most likely due to the fact that there was such an intense emotional experience at the the moment of death that somehow the psyche brought that through into its next experience. And, and so, so what he did is he, he was like, let's figure out how to use the scientific method to encourage skepticism and, and really isolate if this could be real. And because there's so many people in, in the world, I'm not willing to discredit it, right? Because there's millions of millions of people who, who think that reincarnation is a fact. I can't, as a scientist, just say, oh, that's not true. That would be arrogant, right? So he was aware- well, People that, do do that. <laughs> oh yeah. And that's, and again, as, and again, as like a, one of the, these OG neuroscientific, you know, neuropsychiatrists, I think it's really beautiful and humbling that he was like, I don't want to be arrogant because this is such a huge part of world belief. Let's look at this scientifically and figure out if we can create an objective scientific method to see if there's any truth in reality here. And so what he did is he made a framework, right? So they categorized and organized thousands of these cases and and they researched every single one. So he built a team that would get a backlog of information about the person who's coming in. And then they isolated it into basically these interpretations of the cases. One would be just like, let's just say if the first one that everyone who's a skeptic is going to think is it's just fraud, right? And there was fraud. So because people want publicity and people, people want to, you know, to have recognition, people actually do create fraudulent things around this around yeah in spirits <clears throat> community there's oh yeah and spir- it's rampant and, and, and still and now extraterrestrials and alien contact and spiritual oh. stuff like there's <laughs> he said it there's so there's yeah, so right. much it's so true so yep. so the number one thing in the categories was fraud let's see let's see if we can prove that these cases are fraudulent right so that was number one on the list the second was fantasy right? So just people are imagining things. So one is people are almost maliciously creating stories to get attention. One is it's just these woo-woo people who are making fantasies. Oh, I was Cleopatra in my past life, past life or, you know, whatever, these things that you hear all the time. So that would be categorized as fantasy. And then cryptonesia, um, which I believe is people like hearing things, like maybe children hearing stories about things and then making things up so that there was actually information that was coming from somewhere. Um, 
And, and that, that goes into to paramnesia, which is along the same lines. It's just basically receiving information from an outside source, but believing it's true and being able to convince yourself that it's true. Um, the fifth one is where it gets a little bit more metaphysical. His fifth category was possible genetic memory. Like even at this stage, the scientists were, were really curious about, you know, because of, you know, just what we know about genetic evolution, if our actual DNA can hold memory of some type that are that where we could remember things that our ancestors experienced, right? So that was that was his fifth explanation. Um, and then and then um paranormal processes. So this is where it became a little bit more fascinating. And he was willing to consider that any of this could be true, right? A good scientist, based on their bias or their um almost discrimination won't won't discount anything until it can be proven right so then it got into um extra sensory ex extra sensory perception combined with the development of a secondary personality um which meant that maybe some of these people possessed an authentic type of extra extra sensory perception and they were drawing information from a universal field of information, right? Like if our minds can somehow, you know, people refer to this maybe as like the Akashic records where our minds can maybe integrate into some greater field of information and draw information through that, like maybe other people's memories who died. And then we install those programs on ourselves, and we think we were those people, right? So that was one of his categories, extrasensory perception with the development of a secondary uh, personality. Seven was then uh, possession, like spirit possession, if that was real. And maybe these people who were remembering things were actually being influenced by some disincarnate, you know, psychic intelligence of a person who'd previously lived. And then they were somehow being influenced by an external, let's use the word entity, right? And then, and then the, the eighth and final category was true and authentic reincarnation, meaning that a person could actually uh, leave their physical body, die, move into some type of a, a purely uh, psychic reality, a reality of some pure consciousness, and then back into a new form with an imprint of that previous life experience. So that was basically his scientific framework. And every single one of these thousands and thousands of cases that they studied was categorized into one of those areas. What do you think about all that? <sighs> so as far as like that becoming, um, part of a scientific method. I think that there, I don't think that there is any other way that you could measure that, you know, and especially with the, with the, with the, um, the scientific framework that everything is biochemistry, right? Life itself, consciousness, consciousness is just cells that have come together and eventually become aware based on some survival need or something like that. If you put everything into a reductionist lens, then yeah, this doesn't fit into the scientific method. However, if you're a scientist and you're willing to acknowledge that we don't know what we don't know, and that there might be thousands and thousands of years of future evolution where we can learn things that we have no idea and no understanding of now, I think that what he was doing was absolutely brilliant because he had such extraordinary cases and such extraordinary evidence. And once they sorted through the cases that were fraudulent, the cases that were being informed, and they started categorizing cases that had no explanation, like that had absolutely zero logical basis to exist, then reincarnation actually started to seem like the most likely reality for a lot of these cases. Hey, I just wanted to let you know, if you're getting value out of what Josh is talking about and really Josh's insights, I would actually really highly recommend that you check out Josh as he leads a breathwork journey on the challenge that I'm releasing on June 14th called the Seven Days to Timeline Shift Challenge. I was so moved by this podcast when we filmed it that I decided I wanted to have Josh be a part of the challenge that I was releasing and I wanted to have him start it out 
out by doing an incredible breathwork journey. So Josh is leading one on day one to begin the seven day challenge, which is supposed to be very similar to what you would get at a retreat, but without the cost and without the time commitment. And so this is supposed to give you that feel of a, of a genuine challenge. Like, can you challenge yourself to shift your timeline? That's what this is about. If you want to participate in that, I would highly, highly recommend it. And the link is in the description below. So with Ian, what was his experience with it? Did did he think? Do you, do you think? He, I mean, was he convinced, or well, was he just on the fence? Or, <laughs> you know, it's interesting because as a scientific guy, I think we need that too. Because if everyone was like me and they didn't, you know, go through the schooling, I think. The schooling can help to lend credibility because I feel like we're in this precipice where there's so many people that still are convinced that you need a uh, somebody who has this amount of credentials right. to do that. Right. And I still, so I do think that that's helpful for a certain amount of people, but there's yeah. also a different types of people who are like, okay, what is the evidence you've got? Is that enough? Yeah. And there's people that just blindly believe shit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> I think that it's it's good because I th I think a lot of the work that I try to do is link the science and the spirituality, and I really find it fascinating that that's kind of what he was doing. Yeah. So, what do you think about Ian? And if you have the answer to what he thought, if you don't know what he thought, I don't know if you're in his if you know that. But if you don't, like, what do you think in general about the reincarnation phenomena yourself? So, so I'll I'll make an analogy if I can. Um, an, another scientist who I really uh, admire the work of um, is Dr. Rick Strassman, who wrote DMT, Spirit the, the Spirit Molecule. Yeah. And I've gotten to have several deep conversations with him, which was an incredible really? privilege. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Oh, shit. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So, so he, he's, he's a really interesting character. And I'm going to tie this all together. So he's someone who, who came in, who was a scientist, right? Another neuroscientist who was the only person that was ever given permission by the DEA uh, to, to get DMT um, and, and, and with all the institutional approval processes actually administer DMT to hundreds of people, <laughs> which is absolutely crazy. So Dr. Rick Strassman is one of these characters that's in the realm of, it's not even pseudoscience. It's just like, it's like um, it's like science that that it, the the general institutions are like not willing to look at, right? Um, almost like barred science. And so he got through all the red tape with the DEA and all the institutions, and he was able to give administered DMT to a lot of people. And the reason why he did it is because he wanted to know why not just like psychotic schizophrenic experiences, but like why some people have these really prolific spiritual experiences, how that could have a basis in neurochemistry and, and, and if it can be reproduced. So DMT was the most likely compound because it's synthesized in the body. And we know that, that our brain can release endogenous amounts of DMT, right? So we know that in the pineal gland, DMT is produced. Uh, as well as melatonin, our pineal gland is what modulates our circadian rhythm. So, so DMT is only one methylation process away from melatonin, right? So, so dimethyltryptamine means tryptamine, which is produced by our pineal gland, methylated twice, right? So, just two little tweaks in that molecule, and you have DMT. So, so he was one of these scientists who was absolutely fascinated by mystical experiences, kind of like Ian Stevenson, right? Fascinated, but highly objective. And, you know, maybe there's a very strong reason to be skeptical. Maybe none of this is real. It's just biochemical. But he went into his DMT research not being a psychonaut. He went into it being a scientist. And he was excited because as he moved into the work that he did with hundreds of people, literally the, the greatest data that's ever been collected on DMT is in the possession of Dr. Rick Strassman. And the way he described the process to me when we spoke is that he went into the, his case, his case studies and his research being highly skeptical, you know, that, oh, these people are just hallucinating. But then people started to have 
the exact same experiences psychically in their psychedelic experiences. They would literally encounter the same beings, the same like that look and were described identically, the same dimensional experiences where they felt like they were expanding outside of their bodies and moving into these multidimensional frameworks of reality, but that were absolutely identical. And these were people who didn't know each other, who'd never spoken. And this happened time and time and time again. Eventually, Dr. Rick Strassman, I think, tried DMT on himself, um, and it was all being injected. So it wasn't like smoking DMT and having a quick experience. This was a very prolific and profound DMT experience that they were facilitating. Um, and he basically went from being a skeptic to after experiencing it and seeing this many people having these same experiences to then as a scientist saying, I think there's something very real that's happening here. I think that there's elements to the mind that we don't understand. And I think that we live in a universe that's greater than three dimensions, right? And because our brain has only evolved to perceive three dimensions, physics knows that there's more than three dimensions. That's basic geometry and physics. We know that we don't live in a three-dimensional universe. However, our brains have been hardwired to only experience a three-dimensional reality. So Strassman is a great example of a scientist who went into metaphysical research and was kind of converted into more of an agnostic. And like, I don't know what's going on, but I think there's a lot more to consciousness and life than we have any idea of, you know? And Ian Stevenson is the same way, where he went into this research skeptical, just wanting to study a very strange phenomenon because of the, the unimaginable detail that was being just expressed by these children. Once they sorted through fraud and fabrication and information absorption, and they started getting into these cases that were completely impossible that these children could be faking, that's when things got fascinating for him. And he dove really, really, really deep into the research. And I think changed that perspective into one of openness and instead of this arrogant, you know, we have this archetype of this arrogant scientific reductionist materialist who's just like, I don't believe in anything. The, you know, the mind is just the processes of the brain and neurons and, and nothing else is exists. Like not all neuroscientists are like that. You know, Ian Stevenson, Strassman, there's a ton of them now who are basically just like, we don't know what the hell's going on. And this brain is like a holographic multidimensional generation machine that consciousness is a substrate of, but we have no idea really what's going on beyond that. And I think that, that Ian Stevenson really fit into that category where he was a brilliant scientist, academic, highly respected. And he just was like, we don't actually know what's going on, you know? And, and for me, like as someone who also is a health scientist, I love that. I love that. Me too, man. It, yeah. I think that's uh, that's what really does it for me. That <clears throat> really gets me going. Yeah. Just thinking about stuff that we can scientifically measure as well, because I think that that is the future of actually changing the opinions of people who are not willing to try to subjectively experience it yourself, if you can, yeah. like, because you're talking about how you could produce DMT yourself. There are some people that say that they've done it in meditation, they've experienced DMT like states, breath, right? You're big into that. I oh, think you, yeah. you even lead stuff. Do yeah. you do DMT breath and oh, stuff Oh, that's like exactly that? what we do. Okay. So basically I, we lead these, I lead these hour long psychedelic journeys that are really safe for people. You know, I, I, I've done a lot of work with people who've been actually injured by psychedelics, uh, specifically ayahuasca. And what do you mean by injured exactly? I'm just, I'm just very oh, curious. Like, um, like people who went into ceremonies and ended up having like psychotic breaks and like really profoundly disturbing experiences that didn't lead to a greater sense of wholeness, but led to like a, like crisis states that lasted for years. And yeah, you, people can actually get really injured in certain types of these psychedelic experiences and ceremonies. So with the breath work, it's a really safe way because as you breathe, it the, the way that DMT hypothetically is released during breath work is through this um, interlink between the lungs and the brain. 
And as you do this deep rhythmic breathing, um, the, the way that in, in your system, there's two types of DMT that can affect the human brain. One is exogenous DMT, which means coming from something outside of the body and in nature, like acacia and ayahuasca. And there's tons of mimosa hostilis. There's tons of plants that contain DMT and we can isolate it or we can make it synthetic. That's all um, exogenous DMT. Endogenous DMT, which is again, what I think Strassman is also most fascinated by now, Dr. Rick Strassman, is endogenous DMT is D DMT that's actually produced in the body. And one of the ways that we're discovering, Wim Hof talks a lot about this, um, is we can get that DMT re to release through this deep rhythmic breathing. And when you do that, um, the, those parts of the brain are really highly articulated and refined. So when you can get DMT to release on an endogenous level, there's a way lower chance of like overloading your nervous system um, or your sensory systems in your brain. Yeah. So there are different experience. Have you experienced the the external? Yeah. And the internal. You've done them both. Yeah. Absolutely. What do you think the difference is? Um, like I would say that it's more buffered, right? So it's like, if you, if you get a, you know, let's say you get a, a big vaporizer machine and you put a huge chunk of DMT in there and you just like hit it and hit it and hit it till you have a breakthrough. Um, you might have an experience that is really, really brutal. You know, it can be DMT, whether it's 5-MeO or NNDMT can create beautiful experiences where you have insights into these greater dimensional realities, but they can also sometimes be extremely disturbing um, and, and create a lot of psychological harm for some people, not for everyone. Um, but I think that when you do, when you have an endogenous DMT experience, you're not forcing the upregulation of DMT in your system, right? So it's like you can't overdo it. And just like with any chemical that you put in your body, alcohol, THC, everyone's had that experience who's ever eaten a THC edible where oh, it was yeah. just too much. Yep. And then like they're <laughs> having like the worst trip of their lives because they ate too much THC. Yeah. So DMT is not <laughs> immune to that. You smoke too much DMT, you can go way off and do a place that's fucking terrifying and you come and can come back really shaken. So with endogenous DMT, I feel like the body has an ability to regulate those experiences really well. They're very integrated. And when we do it in the work that I do, um, we, we basically lead a deep breath sequence until um, you really can feel this intense energy in your body and vibration. And then I lead it into about an hour long sound journey so that the whole thing can be integrated. Um, and, and yeah, that's, I was just actually asked recently what my favorite psychedelic is. And I said, breath. <laughs> mm. Mm. People don't realize the power of that. It's so powerful that yeah. you can just do it yourself. Yeah. That you yeah. don't need to do that. Do you think that there's a reason that some people psychologically have bad trips? Do you think it has to do with their own state? Do you think it's random? Or do you see people that are struggling more that have more problems? Is there any correlation that you've kind of discovered? I'm just curious. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I actually, among the many projects that I'm doing, um, right now I'm focusing on this project called MetaHuman, which is like a cognitive enhancement um, protocol and a um, like a supplement line that's that's really designed to help people's brains work in the highest states that are human humanly possible. Um, but before I was working on that project, I actually went through a, a two-year process where a friend of mine and I founded uh, a platform called Holistic Evolution, and we were working specifically with people who had had um, crises in psychedelic experiences um, and helping them figure out how to recover in a state of like really intense disassociation, right? So usually if people have a profoundly difficult psychedelic experience, it can result in a deep depersonalization, depression, uh, their sense of self deteriorates, and they can kind of move into a field where they just feel out of sync with everything. And um, so, so what I've found is that that most frequently happens to people who go way f further, I, I think that's that's the first part, way, way further than, than they even understood is possible. Um, so 
when you look at human beings as individuals, right? People like to generalize things. Um, but when you look at human beings as, as individuals, there's a great variance in sensitivity, right? Like some people can do hard drugs like cocaine and MDMA and and do drugs a lot and not have any really negative consequences, like, like unless it's like severe addiction. And some people like myself, um, if I took MDMA or some type of a drug like that, my body would freak out because I'm highly sensitive. My biochemistry is highly sensitive to psychoactive compounds. So I think that sensitivity and dose is a really, really big part of it. And Strassman is another person that he kind of agrees with that. Like people really need to know what their dose to sensitivity ratio is. And then also genetic predispositions to biological processes. Like a lot of, we're finding out in neuroscience now that a lot of uh, biological mental illness is created by problems in methylation, right? So like the body isn't able to methylate and manufacture these molecules that turn into dopamine and serotonin. Like for instance, trip, uh, tryptophan turns into 5-HTP, turns into serotonin. So if someone's having a problem with methylation, their body will not convert the neurotransmitters properly. And then they have like really bad problems with depression, not because there's something intrinsically psychologically wrong with them, but because their brain is literally not making serotonin. And a brain that's not making serotonin is almost like a brain that doesn't have any ketones or fats or glucose to run. It just like exists in this really depressed state. Um, and there's different types of depression. Some can be very psychological and emotional too. But I think that there is a genetic component. Like some people who are kind of more genetically predisp predisposed to having problems with psychoactive drugs uh, need to be very careful with psychedelics. And then people maybe who have a lot of really deep trauma and existing fragmentation of the psyche, because the experience can be so profound that you can take someone who's in kind of a wounded, fragmented state of being, and that can actually um, get worse, like going from like PTSD to like complex PTSD. <clears throat> Interesting. So how do you think people can figure out how sensitive they are? Is there a way that you've done that within yourself? Or is there a test or? Sensitive to psychedelics. I mean, so I just spoke on a psychedelic panel at this amazing uh, conference in Los Angeles called HealthSpan. And it's basically like all the world leaders in, in health science and biohacking and biotechnology are all converging at these different points. HealthSpan is one of them. And I was invited to do a presentation about psychedelics because of this work that we've done with people rehabilitating from psychedelic crisis states. Um, and, you know, sensitivity, I think that if people generally have problems with like drinking or weed or anything and they feel really imbalanced afterwards, that's a really strong sign of like a biochemical sensitivity because some people can drink all night and wake up and barely have a hangover, you know? So it's like people... People, I think, generally should be working on a relationship with their body to where they can have a felt sense of how sensitive they are. Like even we were talking about sugar earlier, right? They were, yeah, so like I know I don't want to, I can't eat very much sugar. It's not good for my body. Um, so but, you just kind of trial and see what works. Yeah, right. You just, you gauge it, right? And then mm -hmm. if, to get more sophisticated, um, you can wear, you know, biometric scanners. So you could have like an aura ring or something like that. And I have a whoop. You have a whoop. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you could basically wear that while you have a psychedelic experience and it could tell you how crazy your heart rate variability and biometrics get. Um, and then what, what I was advocating for in this, uh, at health span was we really actually need to legalize psychedelics entirely so that we can have you know, um, uh, grants and, and resources come on so that scientists can actually identify the genes. Psychedelic therapy is becoming so popular now that we actually really need to know what puts people in at risk categories, even on like a, like a genetic, uh, on, on genomic basis. So with, you've done work with people who struggle with psychedelics, right? Or have struggled. What do you think some of the biggest like reoccurring reasons. Is it just too much? It just take too much. Is that pretty much it? Yeah. It's, I think, or it's, is it like even low doses, people just mess things up? Is mm. there like, I guess this is a hard question, but is it, are people like mentally loose before they take it and that makes them looser? Or do you, do you feel like that has anything to do with it? Like if, 
someone already has a strong grasp or, or I could be just, you know, fabricating that. <laughs> Cause I just wonder, you know, yeah. because maybe if you take too much, even if you are logically like really yeah. into it, that could still like break that up. Like, do you feel like it almost breaks someone's psyche apart and what even makes the psyche in your experience, you know? So that's a really good question. I think that that's actually probably at the cutting edge of neuroscience right now is this question. And and one thing that we do know about the brain is that it is the most complex physical th thing that exists in the universe, right? So, so the level of complexity that we have when we're working with the brain and with the nervous system, especially how it correlates to the experience of awareness or consciousness or the psyche, um, there's, there's so much there that we barely understand it. And so people will understand one aspect of that and then apply it to everything, like a generalization. Like, oh, you had a bad trip on psychedelics, like you have more work to do, you know what I mean? Um, or, oh, you had an, a really a, a traumatic experience on psychedelics, you probably have a genetic predisposition to a mental illness, you know? So all of those things could be uniquely true in individual um, uh, experiences or on a case by case basis. And I think that's what makes this really difficult. But what we, what I've seen as, as definitely something that's a consistency doing this work with hundreds of people is, is that it's too much too fast, right? Too much changes in brain chemistry, like uh, too, too profound of an experience to, if it gets, if the experience goes dark too much intensity of like really dark, scary feelings and experiences that the shadow or whatever, too much of that. And when you put too much pressure on a psyche, you can create a fragmentation, right? Like, like a, 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 an over leveraged nervous system and, and psyche can split almost, right? And then you end up with all these various DSM diagnoses, PTSD, complex PTSD, depersonalization disorder, derealization. Really fundamentally what I think that is, is when the nervous system gets so overloaded, it has a tendency to, to fragment. And so for most people, I say, if you're interested in psychedelics, be really cautious, you know, you don't more, we, we're not in the era of Terrence McKenna anymore. You know, you don't need to go sit in a closet and take five grams of mushrooms, <laughs> you know, we're more in yeah. the era of like micro dosing where it's like, where it's like, take a little bit and like, see how that feels, you know, see what feels safe, move with it intuitively, build a relationship with it. You know, if people want to take mushrooms, I tell them it's better to, it's better to take a small amount a little more frequently and develop a relationship with it than it is to take a huge amount and risk a psychic a psychically fragmenting experience. Um, but generally speaking, if people really deeply desire to progress spiritually and evolve, um, I think that the, the basis of that spiritual evolution is the same that it's been all throughout history. And it really comes down to the breath, you know, the really learning how to regulate your breath because through breath regulation, you regulate your all the chemical processes in your body and you regulate your autonomic nervous system. Um, so breath is fundamental and then breath leads to meditation, which leads to higher states of consciousness. And this is literally what the entire system of yoga is based on. When you're talking about yoga, what do you know about yoga? <laughs> Man, <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> yoga, yoga is one of my favorite subjects. Actually, I yeah. I love yoga so 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 much. It's one of my greatest life passions. We're not talking about stretching. I mean, stretching is a part of it, right? So sure, yeah. So most most people hear the word yoga and and they think that yoga is doing all the stretches and the things, you know. Yeah, that's that's I, pretty. That's what I was making fun of. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So that's actually um, only one limb of eight limbs of yoga, right? So that practice is actually called asana. And unfortunately, there's, you know, with kind of cultural uh, adaptation uh, within, within different world cultures, um, dare I say cultural appropriation, but just like in general, when, when one culture adapts and uh, adopts something from another, um, a lot of the greater picture can be left out. And such is the case with yoga. Yoga uh, actually means union. It means to join. 
And, and so, so the asana, the physical practice of yoga is actually uh, as one branch of yoga is about preparing the physical body to be, to be fit, basically to be, to develop uh, symmetry within your nervous system and your muscular system and to develop a, uh, a relationship between your breath and the way that your body moves. But the entire system of asana was actually developed to prepare uh, new aspirants on the path of yoga to be able to, to move into deeper practices like raja yoga or kriya yoga, which is completely an internal process, which has to do with elevating the mind and experiencing higher states of existence and consciousness. You think there's any science to back oh, yeah. that up? There's, there's so much science now. Yoga, I think that that's one of the, the great beauties of yoga is that it's, it's always been a science. Um, like for thousands of years, yoga has been um, treated as a science in India and Tibet and Nepal and, and all over uh, the Eastern world. And now with this kind of advent of biometric analysis and data analysis and modern Western science, there's actually a big convergence between yoga and neuroscience and, and just basic biochemistry. That's absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, I remember reading Yogananda's interpretations of the Bhagavad Gita, and it says on the cover, the science of God realization. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. I do really think there's a lot more to it than what people understand. Yeah. You know, so what do you think is some of the, do you have any off the top of your head that you remember any science that comes to mind about yoga or about some of these principles? You know, we talked about really what Stevenson did was the science of the reincarnation aspect of yeah. yoga. And they could, because I, from what I understand, tell me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. this could be wrong. Could be mixing Hindu and yoga. Could we just distinguish do what do you think the difference is between the, what people see as Hinduism and yoga? Mm, that's a good question. So, so Hinduism um, is 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 absolutely integrated with yoga in in Indian culture, but yoga can also be looked at as something that's independent from Hinduism because sects of Buddhism integrate yoga. Um, and yoga is even thought of in, in many sects and, and precincts of India as an, as an autonomous practice, right, for, uh, for, for self-realization or God-realization. And um, you brought Yogananda into this, so we can dive into that a little bit. But uh, Yogananda brought a practice called uh, Kriya Yoga to the United States uh, really early on, like I think it was 1920-something. And so he was one of the first um, Indian yogis. He was the first Indian yogi who, who um, became a very prolific figure and led to this massive spread of yoga. Before him, I believe it was Swami Vivekananda, I think, who was like the first Indian yogi to come over. And um, he, he didn't have an explosive revolution behind him. But Yogananda did. And so Yogananda is really seen as like the father of yoga in the West. And Yogananda's teachers, uh, Sri Yukteswar, Lahiri Mahasaya, and, the, and this very mysterious being known as Maha Avatar Babaji, um, they all directed Yogananda's movement to the West because they knew that the, specifically the United States of America would become a hugely influential force in the world. And so Yogananda came to, to teach uh, Kriya Yoga because it's a scientific practice of, of, of elevating the mind um, and that anyone can learn. And, uh, and that was his whole mission was to come here to teach the science of yoga. And in fact, his, actually, his first demographic, uh, people don't realize this, but his first demographic where he was teaching yoga to uh, was actually Christian people. Really? Okay. So do you think he accomplished his mission? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, f fundamentally Yogananda's mission was to make yoga accessible to Americans and for, and for it to be a launching pad to spread yoga all over the entire world. And so I do believe that Yogananda um, definitely, definitely accomplished this. And, and it's funny because his, his mission though, 
was y- the higher aspects of yoga, right? Y- Raja yoga, Kriya yoga. These, these practices that are dealing directly with the mind and consciousness and the, and the soul and also our relationship to the universal principle of consciousness that we could refer to as God or Brahma or the, you know, the, the oneness creator. Uh, there's a name for it in every different religion, but fundamentally yoga is to, is to join your individual self with this greater universal self. Do you think it's possible for everyone? I think if everyone, anyone who desires to have that experience, and it's interesting, we can even pivot it to psychedelics, because I think a lot of people are drawn to psychedelics to have a very profound spiritual experience. But then there's all the pitfalls and the challenges and the potential dangers for some people uh, within that realm. So yoga is this very safe, gradual process. The problem with it is that it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of work. Uh, It takes a lot of self-discipline to experience higher states of consciousness through meditation. So I I do think it's possible for everyone, but I don't think that everyone is at the stage of their life where they're willing to really completely put in the effort and the discipline and the work and build their life in a way that facilitates that process. And so anyone that's interested in it, um, they're absolutely capable. They just have to be ready to commit, you know, to, if you want to, if you want to really have p- profoundly powerful spiritual experiences and, and, and enter into these higher states, uh, it, it, you have to be ready to, to commit to the process. Are those states the same as psychedelic states? <sighs> Because That's, why would you put in all the work if you right. can just take this little thing right here and it right, gets you right there right. in five minutes? You know? Well, so so an, another person who we'll, we'll bring into the equation, right, is um, is a man who was known as Ram Dass. So Ram Dass is, is really dear to my heart. And I actually live at a neighboring property to his in Maui. And I spent, I've spent a lot of time at Ram Dass's uh, temple and property. And it's called the Hanuman Center in Maui. Ram Dass is this like absolutely beautiful example of someone who thought that psychedelics were the solution to all of the problems that human beings are facing, literally. Um, and he, him and Timothy Leary were the two most powerful figures in psychedelics out of Harvard, right? So when that movement happened in the 60s, uh, it happened because um, specifically those two men amassed a huge following. And, you know, what was it? Turn on, tune in, drop out. And, and then Ram Dass's work where they were literally taking LSD like every day for a while. And Ram Dass, he, he knew that he could elevate his mind using LSD, right? And that's not everybody's experiences. I know people who've had horrifying experiences on LSD, but Ram Dass was this very unique person where he could, he could, he could elevate his state of consciousness using LSD and he became devoted to it before he knew about yoga, right? So before he knew about these mystics and yogis and sages, he was just like a devotee to LSD. And they would do these, these deep immersions where they would rent a house and take LSD every day for a week. And then he got frustrated. And this is why this story is so beautiful in this conversation, is that Ram Dass became so frustrated because he always had to come down. And he would get into these higher states of experience, and then he'd crash really hard. And he'd, he'd feel incredibly depressed. And he couldn't figure out how to use psychedelics to sustain an expanded state of consciousness where he felt free and connected to the universe, right? Because that's what, that's what the goal is for these people that are exploring this, is that they, they feel out of the rat race. I mean, I feel like even that whole 60s, 70s hippie movement, people wanted out of this in Dutch industrialist rat race and to experience this greater sense of connectivity, which is yoga, right? But Ram Dass, same thing every time as a scientist, again, another scientist, a psychologist, he would, he would take all these psychedelics and psilocybin and LSD and, you know, and then crash and crash and depression and just struggling and trying to get back up until he got to a point where he learned about yoga and he learned about these masters. And then he was like, I'm going to go and explore India and I'm going to go sit with, with holy men and mystics and yogis. And I'm going to try and understand if they know what LSD is and how, the, and how 
LSD is bringing people into these higher states of consciousness and if it can be reproduced without it and what happens if I give them LSD. So Ramdas went on tour and he was literally giving monks and yogis LSD and and trying to learn about how to sustain higher states of consciousness. And and in some cases that didn't go so well. Um the the real pivotal point in Ramdas's life is when he met a yogi named Neem Karoli Baba, who was like a prolific master. And, and um, he came to him, he was skeptical at first. He, he, was, he was inquiring with him, you know, uh, you know, Baba, we have this uh, medicine in the West that can give you an experience of enlightenment, you know, that can show you God. And, and he was, he was skeptical of it. You know, this, this yogic master, he'd never been exposed to anything like that. You know, he spent his whole life in meditation and practice and was an absolute master. And so, so Neem Karoli, this is the, this is like the best Ramdas story of all time. So Neem Karoli Baba asks him, he says, you know, he says, okay, bring me the medicine, bring me the medicine. So Ramdas brings like a, 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 a whole jar full of LSD capsules and he hands it to him. Neem Karoli opens it. He pours like a, like all the LSD capsules that were in this jar into his hand, and he eats them all. And and Ram Dass and his entourage were like freaked out. They were just like, "Oh my God! Did this little Indian man just eat like an insane amount of hits of LSD?" Right. And and so Maharaji, as he was known, Neem Karoli. He goes, he takes this and he sits in meditation for something like eight hours, right? And he's just sitting there. He's going through the full psychedelic journey with the LSD and, and everybody's kind of watching over him, like terrified that he might freak out because with that dose, the things that we're talking about, <laughs> like people having crisis states, psychosis, like almost these schizophrenic episodes. Was that the biggest dose of all time? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It'd be interesting to actually find someone in the community to ask like how many micrograms or whatever that actually was. Um, and I'm sure that someone who's watching this video could probably find that out. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, I think in the category of a heroic dose and, and anyways, Maharaji comes out of this experience and he comes to Ram Das and he says, interesting medicine. He says, interesting medicine. He says, I don't think that it's, I don't think that it's necessary. And, and I think that that it's possible that this medicine can show you the door of where you're trying to go, but it won't let you through. And, and that moment changed everything for Ram Dass. And when he, when, he, when he saw this master consume this heroic amount of LSD and then tell him, this is not, this is not the path, and it won't let you through the door of what you truly desire to experience. Everything changed for Ram Dass because he saw something that was incredible, you know, for this little Indian man to do what he did. And, 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 and then he, he really opened his heart to him and he became a disciple. So Ram Dass studied with Maharaji for years and years and Maharaji informed every aspect and decision of his life. So here's the classic story of us, literally one of the pioneers of the psychedelic movement, turning his back on psychedelics and moving into yoga because after sitting with a master, he realized what he meant by that, by not being able to move through the door, is that when you take a chemical that expands your consciousness, there's only an aspect of you that's having the experience. It's just your mind, right? And, and, you, can, and you can experience maybe what we'd refer to as God. You can experience God for a moment and then it goes away. And even with Ram Dass, someone who was like a legend with how he took psychedelics. He was always depressed afterwards. He was always seeking. He wasn't finding anything. So what Maharaji meant is that you need to move through that doorway, the kingdom of heaven, as Jesus would put it. You need to move through that doorway with your entire being, right? With your heart. And in, in yoga, they call this bhakti, right? It's becoming devoted to God. And so Ram Das became a, a, a super uh, deep, um, devotee of not a god in hinduism but a archetype in hinduism called hanuman and hanuman was the is basically the, the highest archetype of a devotee to god someone who's completely devoted to 
the universal principle. And again, in Hinduism, they see God as this fundamental source of all life, of all consciousness that's in all beings. And, and so Ramdas's devotion to Hanuman was exactly symmetrical with Ramdas's devotion to God in his own life. And he then spent the rest of his life be, becoming this leader of the heart, you know, becoming this leader, not of someone who was like, let's have a psychedelic mind blowing experience. And, but it was more like, let's serve the world, right? Let's learn how to, how to break through all of our obstructions to love. Let's, let's go. And Ram, one of the things that Ram Dass was famous for, he sat with more people who were dying than almost any other modern spiritual leader that we have in history, right? He sat with hundreds and hundreds of people as they died because that was the most vulnerable place that where, where those people needed support and love the most. So what Maharaji was ultimately teaching him is that a psychedelic might show you something that will be insightful, but it'll never bring you through. And to come through completely into this experience of merging with God and existing in a state like that all the time, it really deeply involves the heart. And we have to cultivate our ability to love ourselves and to love human beings and to love animals, to really truly love our environment. Because again, in that perspective, God's in everything. So if you have the experience, but you don't have the love cultivated through service and devotion and action, you can't get through that gateway. Ooh, shit. That's wild. That is probably the best story of all time on this podcast. I'll just give you that. <laughs> that is absolutely fucking fascinating. Wow. So, last story. I'm just mind blown right now. Sorry. I'm it's sorry. okay. It's okay. I'm just chilling. <laughs> Last, and I'm gonna bring I'm gonna bring it all back, right? So from Dr. Rick Strassman to Ram Dass to LSD, mm -hmm. back to Ian Stevenson. This is a crazy fact in this conversation, and will you really see the full synchronicity? Because my great grandfather, who founded the Department of Psychiatry and, and Neurology, um, and his partner and colleague, Dr. Ian Stevenson, were two of the first people to ever take LSD. They took it together in a controlled environment. And it's just interesting how it all ties that history together, right? Because again, these guys were the early, early neuroscientists. My great-grandfather, Dr. Ian Stevenson, they weren't just psychiatrists, they were neurologists, right? And they were studying this mind-body relationship. So this is deep, you know? This is not like some stupid, fickle, hype-based, oh, this guy studied reincarnation. This is deep at the core of the development of neuroscience. And then Ram Dass, he took LSD, brought it huge into the mainstream, literally was one of the main people who created the Western psychedelic culture. And then he turned his back on it, you know? And, and but where that began was with these other scientists who then it kind, of, kind of were consuming it as a research chemical. And that's where uh, Ram Dass and Timothy Leary discovered it was in through this circuit of medical scientists who were all consuming it and experiencing it as a research chemical. And Dr. Ian Stevenson and my great grandpa were two of the first people to receive LSD and to take it in a research environment. And um, they both <laughs> they both didn't like it. Like it wasn't a good experience for them, I guess. Um, they both said that they thought it was like more of like a model psychosis like a like a way that people who don't have mental illness could experience these almost like states of schizophrenia so they weren't two people that were i think highly engaged in spiritual practice so maybe that's why they had that experience but it, it wasn't something that really impressed them that deeply um and i just thought it was it's notable how it all ties together and they were some of the first people that also took psychedelics so they were all kind of part of that same community yeah wow yeah so that's the story. That's the story. Man, well, I think that's a great place to just just drop the mic. I mean, can't really drop these, but hey, that was amazing. I really appreciate your ability to tell stories and to understand this knowledge. And it's not, like I kind of said at the beginning, I was, you know, we've talked, we haven't talked that much. So <laughs> I was really hoping that you'd live up to that. And like, yeah, I think this guy actually does know what he's talking about. And I really feel like after we had this conversation that, yeah, you have a deep knowledge of how the science links, you know, so 
as someone who has moved into this other field, you know, you're developing this other thing. What do you have going on with MetaHuman and the stuff that you're doing? Because we talked about uh, right. a lot of the other stuff, <laughs> but just you as a person, what's going on in your life and, you know, that area? Well, thank you so much. Yeah. So, uh, so basically, again, you know, my, my spiritual background is in Kriya Yoga, right? Which is what Yogananda brought to the States. And I was fortunate enough to to um, go to an initiation ceremony in uh, Maha Avatar, Babaji, uh, Lahiri Mahasaya, like all these saints in their original lineage. So I got to learn the original Kriya Yoga teachings and, and techniques. And that's been so powerful for me in my journey. So a lot of my spirituality is, is, I would say most of it is informed through those practices and through this, this deep, deep, profound yoga. Um, but then, then on the science level, I went to school for naturopathy and holistic medicine and, uh, you know, strength conditioning. And my passion has been peak performance, right? So how to get the human body, the nervous system into an optimal, optimal, optimal state. And now we're starting to call that biohacking, right? So I'm kind of right in between traditional yoga and the bio and like cutting edge, crazy next level biohacking science. Uh, so MetaHuman, uh, which is MetaHuman.com, uh, MetaHuman is, is kind of the culmination of those two passions for me, right? And so what we're working on right now is a type of a type of a nootropic product, right? So people that know what nootropics are, it's like uh, it's like a supplement or like these all these compounds that enhance the performance of your brain and your nervous system. So so me and my research team, we've been developing a nootropic that that I've never seen anything like this on the market. And really, what we're trying to do is to create this this supplement, this product that people can take on a daily basis every single day. And it's not going to be like a stimulant where you take it and all of a sudden you're going into like Limitless or something like that. You know, the movie Limitless where he takes yeah, the yeah. NZT, whatever. So it's not like that. It's more of like something that you take alongside with your meditation practice. You take it every day and it constantly is improving the biochemistry and the neurology of your brain and your nervous system. So essentially it's a long-term supplement that you stay on and you use it with your yoga, with your meditation, so that you can constantly improve the function of your brain and your nervous system, which is integral with Kriya Yoga, which is what you're doing on the same thing on the subtle and the energetic level. So we're working on increasing um, our biology and our internal awareness at the same time um, and then that leads more into these kind of uh, psychedelic uh, sound healing practices that we do. And I'm traveling all over the world doing that as well. Nice. That sounds really interesting. So where are you at in that process? Like, can we get it? <laughs> Not yet. Get it? Right. Come so on. <laughs> I'm like, ready. Let me try it. <laughs> um, so that that will be launched uh, in, in August. We're, we're on track for August. We're, we're just in the end stages of our... Uh, all of our research and development and uh, everything is looking really amazing. So that Great. should be available on metahuman.com this coming August. Great. Well, we'll keep people updated when, when that is available. I will um, put that in the description and amazing. we'll let, we'll let people know, Thank you, you know, and um, yeah, thanks for coming on today. And where can people find you? Where are uh, you mostly on? Like, where's, where are you? Like some people are mostly on Instagram. Some people are YouTube. Right. Some people aren't even on anything. Like what's, what's going on with you? You know, I haven't spent a lot of time building my Instagram, but I'm feeling like that's the best thing. So Joshua Lee Hanna on Instagram. Um, that's the best way to, to find me. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Yeah. All right, man. <laughs> Great episode. All right, Nick. Thank you so much. Woo! Also, I did just want to let you know again that Josh is going to be leading a breathwork journey, a full journey in my seven days to timeline shift challenge starting on June 14th. And you can check out the description for more information on that. And there's early bird pricing depending on when you're seeing this. So check it out sooner than later if you want to get a discount on that. And he'll be going incredibly deep into how to timeline shift that's just day one, by the way. We've got another day where we've got a human design expert talking about how to use your strategy and authority to really step into who you came to be on this planet. And that is a gist. It's not just shifting timelines to manifest more for your ego. It's about genuinely aligning to what your heart and your soul knows that it's here to do. And if you don't even know what that is yet, that's part of it, right? So this is for someone who's at the beginning stages of I don't even know what that is. 
And it's also for someone who knows what that is, but doesn't know how to actualize it. So this is going to be an incredible community of souls who are coming together to raise their energy and truly transform and shift their timeline. If you want to be in that, again, I highly recommend it. The link's going to be down below. And we'll see you in the next episode of Universe of Game. And until then, peace.